bit. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this class, BC209 on holiness. And um, it's great to be back together and uh, spend some time studying the word and letting God work in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, could I request anyone to please unmute your mic and lead the class in prayer and then we will get started. Everyone, please feel free to do that. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good Great morning. Thank you for another week in the to discuss the your holiness. Father, help us, Lord, in the study to apply your holiness to our lives as we continue to dive in deeper in this session. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. So we uh, we are making our journey in this course, uh, learning about the holiness of God. We started by focusing on the very nature of God. And then we are now transitioning into talking more about ourselves and talking about how God's holiness is then reproduced in us because he is Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us or who makes us holy. And so he wants his nature to be formed in us. And from the very beginning, he created us in his image so we could, you know, be like him, uh, carry his life and nature, reflect uh, his virtues and his grace and his character. And part of that is holiness. So I'm going to quickly review what we did um, in our class on Monday. And then we're going to, you know, progress in this journey of how God works his holiness in us, right? So let's uh, take a moment to uh, review quickly what we did on Monday. I'm going to share the PDF. All right. So we were here, you know, we said that God has called us to be holy. And when we talked about, this is chapter three in the PDF, uh, sorry, chapter two in the PDF. Uh, what does it mean to be holy? Uh, we say, you know, it's not just a set of do's and don'ts, but it's about us uh, receiving the very nature of God, the quality of being holy, and then being in that place of being holy fully consecrated to God. So we are being like him and we are belong and we place of belonging. We belong completely to him. So we need to look at holiness from that perspective. And of course, God works in us to see his holiness reproduced in us and revealed through us. So how does God go about doing that? First of all, he makes the provision for us. Because, you know, on our own, we can't do it. So he initiates the whole process of holiness being worked in us. You know, many times we think that uh, it's only depending on us. Uh, of course, we are involved and we will talk about it a little later. But really, uh, we cannot be holy without God working his holiness in our lives. And actually, we are more dependent on his work in us, and then we just come into cooperation with him. So it begins with the very with the cross of Jesus Christ, that on the cross, the power of sin over our lives has been broken. So that's where it all starts. Holiness starts there on the cross. When we recognize that on the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin so that we could live free from the control and the dominion of sin over our lives. And then we also see the next step that God did. He brought us into Christ. And in Christ, as new creation, 
we have been sanctified, have been sanctified. So it's a work he's already done. It's a provision he's already made. We have been sanctified in Christ. It's done. You know, God said, look, as far as I'm concerned, I've done it for you. I've made you holy in Christ. So live out of that which he has completed for us. So he has broken the power of sin. We have to live out of that. He has sanctified us in Christ. We have to live out of that. We have to let that finished work be reproduced in us, in our everyday life. So we will talk about that in the next chapter, where God works that out in us and he's given us the means or the way in which he wants to work it out in our lives by his spirit, by his word, uh, through his uh, divine discipline. And our response is consecration. We talk about that. And then holiness becomes a way of life for us. So we're looking at, you know, we just, in passing, we're looking at these two things. The fact that the power of sin has been broken, that truth has to be uh, deeply settled in us. And we see in Romans chapter 6, if you look at that chapter very carefully, uh, it tells us, you know, what God did for us in destroying the old sinful nature. And uh, the outcome of all of that is uh, it's going to result in holiness in our lives. And that word holiness is repeated several times in Romans 6. And uh, God's done it. And then he invites us to present ourselves. So that's our consecration part, presenting yourself, which we will talk about a little later. So he does the work of bringing the power of sin. Then he says, now you present yourself. You make the choice of being free from sin. So he does the big part. And then he invites us to do the part that we can, which is the choice we make to be to present ourselves uh, unto God. Make, you know, make ourselves uh, his. And we see that same thing in Titus 2, where Christ died to redeem us from every lawless deed, from every sinful deed. And what was the, what was the, what would be the outcome? Well, he'll purify us for himself, right? So he gave himself, that is, he died for us so that he could set us free from sin. And the end result is, He'll have a holy people for himself. So it all begins at the cross. We know power of sin has been broken. So whatever is troubling us in terms of pulling us down into sin, into unrighteousness, into ungodliness, we must look at it and say, look, your power over my life was broken at the cross. Jesus did it. Jesus defeated that sin, that lawless deed, for me and i'm going to walk in that victory the second part of the work god has finished for us is he has sanctified us in christ and uh, we have um, uh, studied this in our first year course on identity knowing who we are in christ so in christ uh, we have become a new creation and this new man has the very character and nature of being truly of true righteousness and holiness so god is saying look what i've put inside you the nature your nature is one of righteousness and holiness so of a new man if we live according to the new man then we can't help but walk in true righteousness and holiness because that's who god has made us to be in christ and in Christ, you know, and there are several scriptures on this. We are sanctified. So that's the completed work. Now, as we live out of that completed work, we understand the process of holiness, sanctification. That means that is being worked in us, in our lives, in our, in our spirit, soul, and body. It's being worked in us on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is a process. It takes time, and we learn how to you know, live a holy life and we overcome things in our lives and uh, uh, that, that, that process is at work. And that's what we are going to be journeying or studying uh, in, the, in the coming days. So uh, the writer of Hebrews, you know, he points out that we have been sanctified, 
through the cross and we are being sanctified, right? So it's been done and it's being done. It's been done for us through the work of finished work of Christ and it's being worked out in us in day-to-day -day life. So that's the process. And um, uh, practically, you know, how does it work? Well, we consecrate our thoughts, words, and deeds, you know, in our mind and body or our soul and body. Uh, is being set apart for God. So progressively, our thoughts, our words, our deeds are being made holy. They're reflecting the holiness of God. Then our desires, affections, and passions, things that we crave for, the things that we desire for, progressively become holy. They reflect the holiness of God. You know, perhaps in the past, our desires, affections, and passions were unclean. But now God is working in us and it's becoming more and more ref reflecting his desires, his affections, his passions. Uh, thirdly, uh, our dreams, hopes, and aspirations also become holy. That means the pursuits, the thing we, that we you know, pursue, what we feel our priority, what we feel uh, we want to accomplish in life, uh, the purposes uh, or meaning of life all become holy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, example is maybe we wanted to be rich, famous, and powerful, but now we say, God, I want to live a life of fruitfulness and, and a blessing to people and so on. So it's it's transitioning. Now, there's nothing wrong in being successful, fruitful. That's uh, f successful, but but the purpose it becomes different. We want to glorify God. We want to serve people. You know, God sanctifies us even in that space. Uh, how we use our time, talents, and money also becomes holy. You know, uh, we in the past maybe invested our time in, and our uh, skills and our money in things that were frivolous and that didn't amount to much. But now we are seeing, God, everything is unto you. Let it be pleasing to you. Let it be purposeful, you know, where I use my time, talents, and money. And even in what belongs to us, like your family, our home, our possessions, all of these things, you know, we, we look at it from a perspective of holiness, it being consecrated to God. And we want it to be a place where the, where the holiness of God can adorn all of these things, right? So really, God completes the work and then he works it out in us in very practical ways. All of these, every aspect of our lives begin to reflect the beauty of his holiness. So the question is, God has finished the work, but how does he work it out in us? You know, how does it happen in us? That's the part that we are interested in so that we also can be holy even as he is holy. So we're going to touch on that here in the next chapter, sorry, chapter four. And then, you know, uh, we will break it down further as we go into the course. Uh, could somebody plead, re please read for us. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Uh, you can omit these comments I've put in between. Just read, if you can just read the scripture text, please. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. So, the Apostle Paul is uh, saying, look, you know, having these promises, and if you back up into chapter 6, there God has said, you know, um, uh, be separate and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters. You know, so God is, you know, he's, he's called us into that place of being set apart for him. That's chapter six. Uh, so don't be unequally yoked with uh, unbelievers and uh, light and darkness won't mix and God has consecrated you for himself. And so then he, and you are the temple of the living God. So he says, look, you know, this is our promise. You know, God has invited us to this place of holiness. Therefore, 
because God has given us such wonderful promises and invitation, let us cleanse ourselves. So there's a little part, there's a part that we have to play. God has done his part. Then he makes available the means for us to be holy. But we have to do our part. So let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, things that try to stain us. The Greek there, filthiness is talking about staining all the dirt, you know, of the world. Like uh, if you're walking through a very uh, dirty, dusty place, I mean, I'm talking about the natural, uh, you know, the dust and the dirt can just settle on us. It's, you know, it's because you're walking through that place. Now, we are in a, a world around us that that uh, doesn't care about holiness, that doesn't care about righteousness. So obviously there is the, the, the dirt all around us. This, and God is saying, you know, I want you to keep yourself clean from all the filthiness that can touch your flesh and your spirit. That means, so I just want to bring our attention to this, flesh and spirit, that means outer and inner. Right? So we have to be careful. Right? That, uh, and, I, and I think in the other course we're talking about it, that there is a deed, but there's also the insight, the attitude, the desire, the motivation where we could go sinful. You know, so not only God is not only interested in the external, which is the deed, the things that are being done in the flesh, but he's also interested in what's inside the heart. You know, uh, do we have unforgiveness, hatred, jealousy, pride, lust? Um, you know, these are things that are inside. To dealing with our spirit and soul, which could stain our spirit and soul. And so God is saying, keep that clean. You don't let those stains come on you. Uh, and do this, so perfecting holiness. Think about that. Perfecting holiness. It means progressively you're bringing it to completion. Progressively you're finishing it. You know, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, but we are doing our part to perfect holiness in the fear of God, out of reverence for God, right? So that's our part in the soul process. Now, God has made, given us the means. So he's completed the work, meaning on the cross, he broke the power of sin and he set us apart in Christ. He made us holy in Christ. That's a done thing. It's a completed work. Then he gives us the means by which that work can be worked out in us. So what is the means? First, there's the holy empowering that comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, of course, is a spirit of holiness. It sounds redundant, but it's very powerful. He is the spirit of holiness. Means he is God carrying that holiness into us, spirit of holiness. And he sanctifies us. We are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We are made holy, set apart unto God. Now, so we receive the gospel and uh, you know, we are saved, we are born again, wonderful. But then the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He makes us holy. We are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So this is very important. And, and we will get into the details and kind of giving us an overview right now, but we will get into the details of, you know, how the spirit of holiness helps us conquer our flesh and our mind, right? So uh, this is very important, right? The Holy Spirit produces that holiness in us. We will get into the nitty gritties, the outworking, in a later chapter. This, and uh, you know, uh, we see a lot of that given to us in these portions of scripture, which we will examine in detail. Romans 8, Ephesians 5 and Galatians 5. The second way God empowers us is by his word. So he empowers us by the spirit of holiness. 
he also sanctifies us by his word. So the word is like a cleansing agent, if you, if you want to picture it that way. Because Jesus said, you are clean because of the word. Uh, speaking to his disciples, you are clean, you are sanctified because of, your, of the word. Many other places. Uh, John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Also in Ephesians 5, he sanctifies the church. He washes the church by his word. Okay? So the word of God has this cleansing, sanctifying effect on us. He said, you know, in John 8, 32, well-known verse, you will know the truth, the truth will make you free. Free from what? Well, the context is sin. You know, if you ever commit sin is a slave to sin, but the word makes you free. The truth shall make you free, right? So God, by his word, is making us free. Setting us free from the sin, the, the, the stains, the things that stain our flesh and spirit. So it's so important to, um, I would use the word, expose us ourselves or to fill ourselves with the word of God. As we meditate in the word, as we feed upon the word, uh, we are being strengthened, but we're also being cleansed. It's sanctifying us. The word deals with us or God deals with us through his word. The third way God also deals with us in this whole process of working holiness in us is through divine discipline. Divine discipline. So, could uh, somebody uh, please uh, read Hebrews 12, 10 and 11 please for us? Shall I read past? Please go ahead, yeah. Hebrews 12, verse 10 and 11 says, For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Amen. So, God chastens us. Now that word chasten is said, it sounds very harsh, but it's just an old English word to say. He disciplines us or he lovingly corrects us, if you want to put it in a simpler way. He lovingly corrects, like a parent, you know, corrects the child. Uh, do parents correct the children? Yeah. But they don't correct the children with the intent of destroying the children. No, they correct because they want to see something good. You know, they don't want to see the child learn something good. So the writer of Hebrews is drawing that same parallel. And he says, God also is doing that for our profit. I mean, he's correcting us for our benefit, of course. And what's he trying to do? He wants us to be partakers of his holiness. That means that's, then he lovingly disciplines us. It's his way of working in us to make us partakers of his holiness. See, God is involved. He's working it out in us. Now, this may not be a joyful uh, you know, especially when he's dealing with certain things in our lives, sometimes it's painful, it's, it's, you know, hard. But the fruit is righteousness. You know, he works that out in us. But we must be willing to be trained by it. We must be willing to be yield ourselves to the training of divine discipline at work in our lives. We must yield to that. Now, that divine discipline comes to us in, you know, 
primarily a few ways. One is through the loving correction of the Holy Spirit or the loving correction of his word. So for example, let's say, you know, I'm just giving an example. Let's say some person has been rude to me or they've been unfair or they've been, they have not treated me properly. So I'm hurt. And let's say just for an example's sake, I'm carrying that grudge. I'm carrying that ill feeling towards them. Uh, I haven't let it go. You know, I can't. I can't determine that person's action. That person's done something. It's hurt me. But now I'm carrying that ill ill will, that ill feeling, that grudge in my heart. And then. The Holy Spirit is dealing with me. Say, Ashish, you cannot have that. You've got to release it. So inside me, I feel like, yeah, I know it's there. I've got to let it go. It's not right for me to carry this. And then when I read the scriptures, maybe I read, you know, a passage of scripture where God is speaking about forgiveness of letting go. And there are so many places in scripture. So whether you turn in the gospels or whether you turn in the epistles, or you'll find it. God is talking about forgiveness. And I uh, say, so, you know, forgive even as Christ forgave you. Oh, I have to forgive even as Christ forgave me. I can't hold this. You know how much God has forgiven me. Uh, I have to forgive. You know, so he is working that discipline in my life through his word and through his spirit. Now, I might feel like revenge, you know, like well, I, that was not right. I, it's not right for that person to do it. And, you know, I want to stand up for my rights and I, I have a right to stand up for my right and whatever, you know, I have all those arguments and thoughts and those kinds of things. But what must I do? I must yield myself to the training. Okay, God, I understand it. I have to let go. But what about getting back at that person? What about teaching that person a lesson so he doesn't do it again? Yeah. God says, revenge is mine. That's Romans 12. Leave it. Okay, God, I'm leaving this in your hands. Uh, retaliation is not what I'm called to do. Revenge is not part of what I'm to do, I am to forgive and release. I cannot think of revenge or retaliation or teaching that person a lesson, no. You know, that will, God will do it. My part is to forgive. And so, you know, God works that in and then I'm letting go. And then uh, he replaces it with love. And when I meet the person again, uh, there's no animosity. There is no sense of let me get back at that person, no. Instead, it's like, okay, let me show love. Uh, you know, I speak words of kindness. Do something that will bless that person. And the Bible says, you know, First Peter 3, we are called to do this, to inherit a blessing like this. So God trains us. You know. So when you go through that training, the first time it may be hard. The second time somebody else does something harsh to you, well, it becomes a little easier now to just let it go. The third time, the tenth time, and maybe by the time, you know, you and I are living in this world, you know, there would be hundreds of times when people offend us and hurt us, maybe thousands of times. But then because we have been trained by it, then it becomes a normal reaction. The moment somebody says something, somebody hurts you, the normal reaction is, Lord, I forgive and it's not a big thing to forgive and not a big thing to just respond in love. Why? You've been trained by it and you're now a partaker of his holiness. You are now walking in that aspect of his nature because you've been trained by it. Now, initially, it was hard. But now, it's part of your normal response to forgive. It's the normal thing to do. 
right? So just one example. Now, sometimes this discipline can also come through external means, uh, which, may, which is that God can use uh, others uh, in the body, you know, and that's why we are part of the body. So he can use uh, other people uh, to speak into our lives. You know, sometimes you might hear a sermon, sometimes you're having a conversation and they say something that, you know, that brings correction. And sometimes we openly ask for correction. That means, uh, you know, you know you're in the wrong and you sit down and say, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, what do you think I should have done? And then they will speak into your life and they say, see, this is what the Bible says and uh, this is what you should have done. And then you receive that correction, right? And that helps us uh, be a partaker of the holiness of God, okay? So God works that way. And sometimes we just end up reaping uh, what we have sown. Okay. All right. Um, somebody's mic is on. Could you please turn it off? Thank you. Um, so, okay. Okay. So uh, sometimes, uh, and we hopefully we don't have too many of these experiences, but uh, sometimes we just end up reaping what we have sown. That is, you know, God is telling us, don't do something, don't do something, but we, you know, and we may sow, I mean, we may just go ahead and do it, and then we face the consequences of our actions. Uh, and then, so that is a hard part, but that is also a learning part, you know, and in that, going through the consequences of our actions, uh, we learn and God is you know, lovingly teaching us and uh, there is mercy there. And so he lessens the impact. I mean, when I'm saying, you know, when we turn to God, say, oh God, I should not have done it, but here's this, and God is merciful. Uh, although he, you know, he, he lets us go through the process of reaping what we have sown, his mercy, uh, you know, lessens all of that uh, so that, you know, uh, uh, we go through it, we learn, and we come through the con you know, learning from those actions, and hopefully we come out better, right? So primarily through his word and his spirit, God disciplines us. And as we are trained by it, it becomes easier to be walking in his nature of holiness. Uh, he also uses other people around us to speak into our lives. And there are times we just go through the circumstances or situations where we, you know, face the consequences of our actions and uh, God lets that have its work in our lives, okay? So there is this, this outworking of that holiness that happens in our lives and uh, we need to understand how God is working and how God does that. But the key is, our consecration, which is our response. So God never overrides our will. You know, God is not going to force holiness into you and me, right? So let's say we become believers. At that moment, the work of Christ on the cross becomes ours. Our identity in Christ, our life in Christ become, becomes ours. So that's the finished work. It's ours. And then in our spiritual journey as believers, God has given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us his word. He's placed us in, in, in a community of believers around us. And he says, okay, let me work holiness into you in your everyday life. Let me touch your mind your uh, your behavior let me touch your desires let me touch your passions let me touch your pursuits let me touch your personal things and you know he's working holiness in every aspect of our lives but there's one thing god cannot do he cannot force it on us he will not so that is the part where God depends on our response, and that is called consecration. It means we are saying yes, willingly, right? So 
You can see this in both the Testaments, right? Uh, he says, consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. So consecrate yourself, that's your part. Be holy is invitation. The Lord is holy. Right? So that consecration is our response, but even that is empowered by His Spirit. Thank God for that. That means when my ability, so I, I may have the willingness, but my ability aligned to that willingness is weak, then He empowers that ability so that my willingness is strengthened. But that willingness is mine. I, I have to say, yes, Lord. But I feel weak. But that's where He strengthens us, by His Word, by His Spirit, uh, through the help of other people in the body of Christ. And he strengthens us. He strengthens our ability. But my willingness must is, of course, mine. I only have to say, yes, I'm willing, Lord. Here I am, Lord. And then He empowers that willingness. Now, I think one of the you know, best scripture texts that uh, challenge us in this consecration area is Matthew 5, 29 and 30. So he says, Jesus says, look, if your right eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out and cast it. If your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off and cast it. Yeah, because it's better that you you know make this journey to heaven without that thing that's causing you to sin. Now, obviously, he's painting a picture for us here. He's not talking about a literal physical eye. It means all of us by now would be blind in both eyes and without hands and feet. Now, he's not talking about literal. What's he talking about? He's saying, look, if something that is so much a part of you, so close to you, but it's causing you to sin, then amputate it, cut it off. Now that plucking out and casting out is painful. But that's what it takes to walk the path of holiness. And that plucking out and casting out is something we have to do with the help of God. I mean, see, empowers us, but we have to be willing to do it. It's not something God is going to come in and chop, chop, chop your eye out, cut your hand off, cut your feet off. God's not going to do that. He waits for our willingness and then He empowers us to get it done. It's almost like, you know, in the medical field, you know, if somebody has a tumor, just this example. The doctor's not going to keep chasing the patient to cut it off, no. The patient has to come willingly and rest on the operating table. Make yourself available. Then the doctor cuts it out. It's like that. We come willingly and say, yes, Lord, I concentrate. Here's something in my life that's been a part of me, but it's causing me to sin. So I make myself willing. God, Help me. I want to plug it out and cast it off from me. So that that initial step is mine. I must say yes. I must say, God, I want it out. Then he empowers by his word, by his spirit, and he works it in us to get it out of our lives. And that part is not, I'm repeating, it's not easy. Sometimes it's painful, but that's consecration. That's what we must be willing 
to go through to be trained by his holy his, his work in us to perfect holiness in our lives and just one one or two more thoughts and then i'll pause i know it's almost the end of the hour um the the litmus test if you will right that means if there's one test that i should do to see if i'm really walking in holiness what would it be It is walking in love. Could somebody read First Thessalonians 3, 12 to 13 for us, please? First Thessalonians. Okay. Chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. Go ahead, please. Yeah. And may the Lord may make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. So. Notice, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, when, when uh, things are broken into two verses, uh, it sometimes uh, is, is misleading, you know. But I want you to look at this as one sentence, because it is one sentence, right? What is the Holy Spirit saying through the Apostle Paul? He's writing to believers. It says, increase in abundant love to one another and to all. That means... You love your community of believers, one another, and to all, meaning even those outside the community that you're part of, to all, everybody else, even the unsaved. Right? He's saying, I want you to increase and abound what? In love. For what? So that, so that, it's one sentence, so that. He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God. Walk in love, increase in abundant love, so that you can be established blameless in holiness. And also in view of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Sorry. So if there's one test that we can check on our lives, on ourselves, to ask ourselves, am I walking in holiness? Then it's am I walking in love? The expression of holiness. Am I walking in love? To whom? other believers as well as to non-believers, to all. Because when we walk in love, uh, he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. I mean, love is that, that positioning that keeps us in him and him in us, you know. So that's a simple test. If, I, if I'm doing, doing things motivated by love, if I'm reacting in love, I'm responding in love, uh, you know, if I'm motivated by love, then I can be sure that I'm in that space of holiness. Because they are interconnected, of course. Right? So that's a, you know, what we could call as a litmus test, simple test, you know, just one check. You do. Am I in love? If I'm not in love, then very like, and then definitely I'm not in holiness. But if I'm in, I'm in the love of God, would this what love would do? Is this the way love would react? Is this the way love would respond? Or am I really being motivated by love? Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not irritable. You know, those are the expressions of love. And if I keep that, keep myself in the love of God, 
we can keep ourselves in holiness. Okay. Uh, I will pause here. I, there's just one more thought, but I, I I don't want to take up the time in the class. I have just four minutes. We'll be able to finish this next week. And, okay. Uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions and discussions. I hope, uh, let's see now. Okay. Uh, everyone's, everyone's been with me so far? Okay. Uh, any questions, please? Yes, go ahead, um, Debya and then Sri Kumar. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just had a question with uh, regard to the last point that you were saying, Pastor. Like, uh, so is holiness? Does holiness comes in come into play only in relation to, you know, people? I feel, uh, or like. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, holiness has to do, like we said, with everything, you know, even the way I, I, I may use my time, in the way I may use my money, uh, in the way I may, you know, just, it just touches everything, right? And not all of this may be directly affecting somebody else, may or may not. Example, you know, uh, uh, money, you know, uh, uh, Maybe I was spending money on something that wasn't useful and I just stopped spending that money. That decision may or may not affect anybody else. It's an act of consecration to God. Yeah. So I'm not saying every decision affects somebody else, but um, definitely, uh, let, me, you know, let, me, let me say that our relations with people is definitely a big part of our walk in holiness. Uh, there will be these personal, you know, my personal decisions of what somebody wants to pursue in life and so on. Uh, it's personal, but in some way it may impact other people, right? Uh, so I'm not saying, so to answer your question, holiness to a big part does impact it has to do with other, our relationship with other people, but it's not only that because there are some things that are very personal and choices that are individual. Okay, okay, Pastor. I had just one more question. Can I ask? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I always uh, think about this Paul's prayer in Ephesians three, where he says uh, to have that comprehension of God's love, mm -hmm. like uh, the length and breadth. So, um, uh, uh, so I am thinking like, uh, does that comprehension of God's love motivate a person to holiness? Is it a motivating factor to holiness? Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, uh, it definitely puts us in a place where our thoughts, choices, and actions would be directed towards holiness when we are motivated by an understanding of the love of God, you know. So you would respond in love, which then eventually will mean that you're doing something that's holy uh, to God. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, we are out of time. But Shikmar, if your question is small, uh, we could definitely try to answer it. Do you want to ask your question? Well, I can ask in, uh, ne next. Oh. Okay. 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 Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Just please remember to remind me. Uh, sure, uh, sure. 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 On, sure. On, okay. on Monday, so that. I can yes. Ask. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, sorry for rushing out of the class. It's time up. I don't want to hold back the next class. Somebody could quickly uh, pray, and then we will close. Can I pray? Please go ahead. Yeah. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day which you have given to us, O God. Prepare our heart, O Father God, so that we can walk, Lord Master, in your nature and in your in your in your way. Lord, as we learn, O Father God, 
that Father God, your your love sanctifies us, your love prompts us of Father God to walk in the holiness. We we pray that Father, let our heart should not be hardened, so that we we miss that opportunity where Lord Master, you wants to correct us, Father. Give us that grace to be humble and receive your receive your instructions so that we can walk away, we can walk in our life which pleases you, God Master. We surrender everything into your mighty hand. Give us grace that we can able to walk in that holiness which you are expecting from us, God. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a good um, rest of the day. I'll, uh, we'll connect again next week.